and welcome to Festival of IODs online. My name's Andrew Kelly from Bristol Festival Ideas, and it's a great honor to have with us today Thomas Frank. Uh, Thomas is the author of the new book, People Without Power, The War on Populism and the Fight for Democracy. And we're going to be talking about that today, but also about some other issues as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, the, uh, the, the ask a question button is there. Please do uh, check that out and, and put questions there. And in the chat, do let us know where you're from. We noticed someone already from Franklin in Tennessee, uh, from Bristol, Wiltshire, Alborough uh, and elsewhere. You're very welcome and thank you very much uh, for joining us. You can also vote in the ask a question and we can then take questions in order of, of preference. Um, I'll be talking more about Thomas's work through, this, through the discussion, but thank you very much, Thomas Frank, for joining us. Thomas, this is a book about populism. And when we talk about populism now, we, we think about Brexit and about Donald Trump, uh, about you know racism and nativism and so on. But we've got that very much wrong, haven't we? Can you take us through the, the early stages of the populist movement? Yes. And Andrew, first, I just want to say how nice it is to be. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm just sitting in my in my house in Washington, D.C., but you're in you're in Bristol and it's Awfully nice of you guys to invite me to the Bristol Festival of Ideas, and I sincerely wish I was in Bristol at this very moment. <laughs> but no, uh, I'm here in Washington. And uh, populism. So it's an American word. The word is is really significant to me uh, because I come from uh, the state of Kansas, which actually happens to be... <laughs> So they know that I'm on. You, you hear that? People are phoning me now. They know that I'm at the Bristol Festival I Ideas and they just they, they have to interrupt it somehow. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Anyhow, the, the, the word the, the, the populist movement was it was a uh, left wing third party movement in the United States. And then in the 1890s, uh, it was largely made up of uh, farmers, but it was uh, they also reached out to industrial workers. And it was basically the American, uh, the abortive American equivalent of the Labour Party in England or the Labour Party in Australia or like the Social Democratic Party in Germany or Austria or something like that. All of these different um, left wing movements were getting started at around the same time. And populism was more or less an American equivalent of those things. And the word uh, they came up with it one day. It's the, the the story of populism is very romantic and it's, you know, it's charming and it ends uh, sadly. It ends, you know, in disaster. And so uh, historians have always been drawn American historians that is have always been drawn to studying the populist movement and writing about the populist movement. And uh, this is where the word populism actually comes from. Uh, it comes from my home state of Kansas. Uh, a bunch of uh, local politicians were on a train one day traveling from Kansas City to Topeka, which is the capital of Kansas. And they were their movement was just getting going at that time. They had just uh, uh, prevailed in uh, local elections in the state of Kansas. They had dealt this it, it, this incredible out of nowhere defeat to the local Republican Party, uh, who were the, the sort of dominant political force in the state then as they are today but the populists were uh, these guys were uh they were called the people's party they were riding on a train to topeka and they were casting around for words they were trying to invent a new word to describe um supporters of their third party effort and they just came up with populism uh, out of, you know, by throwing together, you know, some Latin stuff, you know, <laughs> they came up with this word and it was it made uh, it was in the populist newspapers within a matter of days. Uh, they were using it and it they knew they had something explosive on their hands. The uh, the word that is uh, in addition to the party itself, which was also growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, and the word did indeed take off uh, immediately. Now, the story of should I stop there? Or should I keep carry going? on? Carry on, yeah, yeah. So the the story of the populist party is 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 kind of sad. They uh, at first they grew and grew and grew. This is a period of uh, enormous um, uh, uh, inequality in America. The eighteen nineties. You know, this is when industrialization is going. There's no regulations of any kind. Monopolies are forming. You know, the railroads have this incredible power, and farmers as a group are headed downward you know they're losing everything 
And uh, so they were the, the populists came together and demanded, first of all, that we that we take America off the gold standard. Second of all, that the government nationalized the railroads. You can imagine how that played in America in the 1890s. And, and then third of all, uh, uh, the, you know, they wanted to do a bunch of stuff with um, uh, absentee landowners and things like that. They also wanted to reform the political process. They wanted votes for women. Uh, they wanted to, uh, you know, have have more uh, direct democracy. So uh, instead of, well, I, I don't want to, you know, g- get into the uh, the weeds of the American political system, but just suffice it to say that the system was designed long ago to insulate the government from the voice of the people. And the populists thought that was a terrible idea because what that actually does is it just makes it possible for uh, lobbyists and uh, uh, would-be bribers to control everything, which they did in the 1890s. I mean, the Vanderbilt family very famously contrived, the Vanderbilt family owned an important railroad in America, and they contrived to... um, to send their family lawyer to the U.S. Senate <laughs> and populists. These people won't stop calling me. They just they know this is going on. There went the cell phone. And <laughs> they, uh, they uh, anyhow, so the populists wanted to do all these uh, the, uh, political reforms in addition to all the economic reforms that they that they proposed. Uh, and at first it seemed like they were the coming force. In American politics, the Populist Party, which, as I say, the name caught on, and after a while, nobody even rem- remembered that it had a, it had had a it had a formal name that was different from that. But the Populist Party uh, grew by leaps and bounds. There were these huge strikes in America at this time in the 1890s. There was a terrible depression. And it looked like this was the uh, that like these people were going to grow and grow and grow and take power. And what happened instead was that the Democratic Party, one of our two main parties in America, uh, swerved dramatically to the left and absorbed uh, the populists. And then uh, having absorbed them, then crashed and burned and got defeated in this. We had this you know, epical election in America in 1896 where the sort of populist de- Democratic candidate a guy named William Jennings Bryan. He was a famous orator. Uh, he uh, uh, went up against the Republican candidate, William McKinley. And uh, McKinley was supported by, this is, by the way, this is this is a, a great story. And I think one of the best parts uh, of the book uh, is the, the story of Bryan versus McKinley. Bryan had won the nomination of the Democratic Party by strength of oratory alone. He was 36 years old. Uh, you know, we've never had a president that young. He's the youngest presidential candidate of all time in America. He had given an incredible speech to the Democratic Convention uh, denouncing the gold standard. He said, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And they were bowled over by this this speech that he gave, and they nominated him for president, made him their standard bearer, and sent him out against the Republican Party. The Republican uh, Party perceived this as class war. This was it. This was the, uh, the, the class war come home to America. This guy, William Jennings Bryan, leading these uh, uh, filthy hordes of the unwashed against you know, the citadels of power. And the Republicans uh, uh, basically raised the largest war chest we've ever seen in America. If you adjust for uh, inflation and the size of the economy and things like that, Bryan had nothing. He went around the country by himself, uh, speaking to audiences. Now he happened to be a very, you know, instantly famous man, a man of destiny, you know, this great figure. And so he would travel around the country in what was then called a day coach, uh, carrying his own suitcases. <laughs> and the Republicans just buried him under an avalanche of money. And uh, they also they brought together this. What I this is, and this is an important part of the story. It's what I call anti-populism. Mm. The Republicans brought together an incredible sort of gathering of the elite tribes of America in 1896 to denounce William Jennings Bryan. And when I say the elites, I mean all of them, Uh, the professional classes, the lawyers, the economists, and also the tycoons, the railroad owners. The um, now these people are texting me. I have no idea what they want, but they know that I'm at the Bristol Ideas Festival and that they've just got to get through. They've just got to. And uh, anyhow, so they brought together this this incredible gathering of of the tribes of the elite 
the newspapers of America were against Brian in this in the most extraordinary fashion. And I've I've uh, for this book, I went and researched a lot a lot of the political cartoons of the 1890s, which are really quite wonderful. Uh, technically speaking, you know, they're full color, they're beautifully executed, and they're they're absolutely disgusting from a 20th century, or I guess we're in the 21st century now, 21st century democratic, you know, lowercase d democratic point of view. They're just absolutely repulsive, it, but uh, uh, at the time, very effective. Anyhow, all of this done to denounce William Jennings Bryan and depict him as a, a kind of um, uh, satanic monster of, uh, uh, you know, of, of mob rule. And along the way, they did a very interesting thing. Well, they were they were sort of ginning up this hysterical campaign against William Jennings Bryan. And that is they were looking about like those guys on the train in 1891. They were looking about for a single word with which to identify everything that they perceived as being wrong with William Jennings Bryan. So he, they said he was mentally ill. He was a puppet in the hands of others. He was a uh, 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 you know, a fool. He was uh, um, anti-intellectual because he wanted to take us off the gold standard. And this was the province of professional uh, academics, you know, economists, and he he should not be meddling in such a thing. So anti-intellectual. But above all, he represented an uprising of the unfit of society's lowest orders. And these people had you know, because of democracy, these people had this wrong idea that they were entitled to tell the owners of America how to run this country. And the word that they used to describe this, um, this, uh, you know, everything that was wrong with William Jennings Bryan, the word that they settled on was populism. And so there's this hysterical uh, reaction against populism in America in the 1890s. And that's really where the book begins. It's a story of uh, it's a story. It's an American story. It's a story of these left wing uh, farmer labor movements through our history uh, that that follow in the populist tradition and the backlash against them, which always comes in this same form, uh, denouncing <clears throat> the lower orders of society for uh, basically for aspiring, as you would say in England, aspiring above their station. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this isn't, by the way, this is a very old theme. In democracy, this goes back to the very beginnings. Uh, this is, you know, this is how people reacted to the American Revolution. This is how people reacted to the French Revolution, and um, I mean, the the founding fathers of America, uh, you almost universally, with the with the exception of Thomas Jefferson, uh, hated and feared the idea of democracy. But what you what you find is that later on, it becomes um, impossible for uh, uh, leading Americans to say that. You know, this is a democratic country. We it we we. we uh, uh, you know, formally, technically, we like democracy. Everybody in America thinks democracy is good. So you can't say that anymore. You can't say democracy is this awful thing because it unleashes the mob and the lower orders, uh, you know, get out of out of place and the world gets turned upside down. So what do you say instead? You use the word populism. And I so I trace how this word um sort of gets uh, misappropriated over the decades, you know, from the 1890s up to the present to where, to where we are now, where it has come to mean something that is completely the opposite of the way it starts. Just just before we come on to that, because I want to come on to the present, but I want to talk about this kind of two high points of populism in the way you've described it and from that side of the political <laughs> divide, which is the first is, you know, what you call peak populism in the proletarian decade, the period of Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. Um, and then the second one is, is Martin Luther King and, you know, not just about civil rights, but about economic justice as well. But but just before we go into those, just two quick questions about the, the, the origins. The first is about what was the attitude towards race and, and what was the position of women in, in the populist movement? So the, uh, the uh, populism uniquely among the big political parties of this era uh, had women in positions of leadership. This was um, unheard of. Uh, and historians wonder why that is the case. Uh, and it probably comes from their origins as a as a farmer movement on the frontier. Obviously, women were pretty much equal to men. And uh, so there's there's that aspect of it. But in I'm, in my home state of Kansas, which was, you know, uh, had been frontier 20 years previously, the great the great sort of um, leader of of the populist movement at first was a woman called Mary Elizabeth Lease. And uh, she was uh, something extraordinary. She was an orator and she would travel around the state speaking to farmers groups 
And we don't really know what she said or what she sounded like. Uh, all that has come down to us is like photographs of her and, uh, you know, a few things here and there. But we know that she had a catchphrase. <laughs> and that was you. What you farmers need to do is raise less corn and more hell. And this this was regarded as really shocking at the time. <laughs> Anyhow, but uh, yeah, the, the, so the, the movement was identified with women. And in several Western states in Colorado and in Idaho, they actually secured the right uh, to vote for women. They secured the uh, which didn't come nationally for ooh, 30 more years. But the populace got it done in some places. Now, uh, it, uh, on on the race question, they uh, so populism, the other region of America where it was uh, powerful uh, was the South and um, largely uh, at that time, an agricultural region still is really. <clears throat> and the South had been ruled since the um, I don't again, don't want to get into the weeds of American history, but after the Civil War, uh, the uh, northern the, the northern uh, army ruled the South for a number of years and tried to you know uh, tried to solve the race question there. They half heartedly they didn't do a very good job, and eventually they left. That period is called Reconstruction, and as soon as Reconstruction ended, the white Southern uh, you know ruling class took over again. And they were identified with the Democratic Party. They were called Bourbon Democrats. You know, the, the drink, bourbon. <laughs> they, they liked that stuff. At least they had good taste in liquor. Anyhow, they, uh, these were extremely conservative uh, 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 Democrats, politicians. And they, um, they, the way they sealed their uh, control of the South was through what, what they called um, white solidarity. The idea that white people... Uh, you know, that their their interests were as whites, not as farmers or as workers or something else. Their their interests were with other members of their own race. So they had to you know, they had to stick together and they had to support the Bourbon Democrats, who also happened to be the ruling elite of the South. And populism comes along in the 1890s and makes a very, very different and uh, shocking proposal, which is that, no, in fact, your interests as farmers uh, is closer to that of black farmers than it is to that of the white, uh, uh, the bourbon Democrats. So these white farmers that I'm speaking of are by and large sharecroppers. Do you, I don't know if you know what that is in England. They don't own the land. They just work it. And they, they are extremely poor. <clears throat> and this is the position of, by and large, this is the p position of, of most blacks in the South at the same time. And so the populist made this very, um, startling proposal, which is we're going to reach out to black uh, voters in the South. And at the time, blacks could still uh, vote in most southern states. And uh, they they tried this and it didn't uh, it, it worked in some places. There was a, uh, a large black contingent of the populist party and they uh, they were successful in some places. But it again, it ended really, really badly. It ended in violence and uh, all sorts of electoral shenanigans as the Bourbon Democrats used every trick in the book to um, uh, uh, every trick in the book to make sure that these people didn't prevail. And then when they had finally beaten populism down, they actually um, disenfranchised black voters in the South and a lot of poor whites too, took the vote away from them through uh, various means like the uh, poll taxes and literacy tests and stuff like that. This is a, it's a really awful story. It was a very short lived effort that ended in disaster. And, uh, but that was, that was, <laughs> that was the ideal. And uh, people have looked, or I should say before the civil rights movement, people used to look back to this very brief chapter in the 1890s as, uh, as evidence that you, that you could do, you could do something with the South. You know, there was hope that you could, that you could bring these groups together and, and even come out on top possibly. And that's the, uh, the, the Martin Luther King moment that you were referring to earlier. But anyhow, that's that's that I, I should say I don't want to get ahead of myself. It's important to remember this whenever we talk about whenever we say that, you know, when people talk about populism as a racist movement, they're completely missing the, uh, the misunderstanding where the word comes from. It's a projection that we, uh, you know, that we that we do, that, you know, a sort of modern day projection that we think of, uh, 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 you know, that, that mo well, I, I don't want to go there either. I want to I want to go back to you and I don't want to get too deep in the American weeds, sure. although it is a book of American history. Yeah. Well, we will come oh. on. And, there's been a and, and it does tell you how we got this guy, Trump. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to come on to him in a moment. Um, just just on, on the Roosevelt story, because this is the peak populist view. 
you know, you you report and write about Roosevelt's incredible speeches that he made and his attack on elites and so on, support for working people. And but did he call himself a populist or, or did? Uh, no, he he did not. That would have been really uh, unusual at that time. So I went part of the the fun, you know, the research. There's a lot of I had a lot of fun with the research for this. Part of it was reading old dictionaries to see when the word started to change. And in the 1930s, the word was only used in a historic uppercase P only used in a historical sense to describe um, this party that had been in the 1890s. Uh, it was occasionally used to describe parties in other countries that appealed to farmers. Uh, but that was about it. Uh, it, but no, Roosevelt never called himself that, but he, uh, he used populist language all the time, uh, made appeals to, uh, workers and farmers. And this is totally forgotten today, but once upon a time, the sort of liberal Democrats in America, uh, uh, yes, appealed to farmers and yes, won the farm vote very handily. Uh, you, you still saw echoes of that up until recently. I, I used to know the, uh, democratic Senator from North Dakota, Byron Dorgan, who is about as was as close to a populist as anybody, a, a real American populist as anybody could be very, you know, on the left uh, end of the Democratic Party spectrum. And he was from, a, you know, a farm state. Uh, anyhow, this is all gone today. But at that time, yeah, uh, Roosevelt uh, campaigned in farm country all the time, was very successful. But it was it was also it was not just the, this is important to remember. It's not just Roosevelt in the 1930s. What made the American 1930s so great? Uh, and I, I want to before I talk about what made it great, I want to contrast it with what was going on in Europe. You know, for America, the 1930s was a democratic, a period of democratic flowering. This was the decade of the common man. You know, the Frank Capra movies about the nobility of, of the, you know, of of of, of the every man, uh, the WPA murals that we were putting up all over the place. I hope we get to talk about Orson Welles movies and stuff like that. But this was, that was America. Europe was going the other way. I mean, Europe was producing books like um, uh, uh, Ortega y Gasset, right? Revolt of the Masses. Uh, all of these people in places like, well, Germany, <laughs> not to mention Spain, Italy, many other countries in Europe were saying democracy is done. We have to, you know, we have to entrust this elite. We and, you know, embracing this this kind of awful racist theory, this eugenics theories and stuff like that. America was going the other way. And we were at the So we were well ahead of Europe. These are stuff that things that that England or Great Britain, I should say, embraced after World War Two. But in America, it was all in full effect, uh, you know, by the middle of the 1930s, this sort of incredible flowering of, of uh, proletarian culture. It was also this was the great moment for labor organization in America. This is when the unions caught on and were growing by leaps and bounds. Um, they uh, they tripled in size in the course of the decade. And they were by far the you know, this was obviously the great coming power in American life or so everyone thought um, in the 1930s. And, you know, I could talk about the sort of culture of the 1930s ad infinitum. I, I imagine it's, it would be kind of annoying to someone in Britain. But let me just say this went on into World War Two. And there are there are pieces of it that you're probably familiar with. I don't know if you remember Bill Malden, the great G.I. cartoonist with his the everyman American soldiers. And that's how we that's how we thought of World War Two. It was it was not about the officers. It was not about the generals. It was not about the, you know, uh, the geniuses. It was about it was about Willie and Joe, you know, the average American who has been the citizen soldier who has been sent to fight the Nazis. And so I end that chapter with it. You know, it's it isn't you know, I, I uh, let me just tell you that one of the moments that made me write this book, I was watching a documentary about World War II. I'm really I, I like reading and about World War Two. And I was watching a documentary on TV, a British documentary about World War Two. And I'll be damned if it didn't refer to Adolf fucking Hitler as a populist. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what? You know, what the hell? The populists are the ones who kicked his ass. You know, that was us. That was Roosevelt. We did that. You know, thank populism for, for finishing that guy. Anyhow. One, one, uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask you about Martin Luther King in a moment, and, and do please um, put questions into the into the ask a question box if you'd like to ask a question. But just on this issue about popular culture and why, you know, I, what's you know, you talk about you know the writings, the the Richard Wrights and the Margaret Bork Whites and the you know the 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 Paul Robeson's um, Ballad of the 
Ballad for Americans. Yes, and, um, yes. and, and, and all, of your, all of your listeners can go. They, all of this stuff is available now on YouTube. YouTube. You can yeah. listen to Paul Robeson sing, yeah. you know, yeah. it, this incredible sort of populist yeah. anthem from the late 30s. Uh, and you, those, well, the books are a little uh, trickier to track down, but you're referring to there was a style in American photography and in American literature. So the government, actually, the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, they did all of these amazing sort of cultural interventions, uh, had hired mural painters, hired people to write guidebooks to the state. I collect them, by the way. Let's see. Yeah, here's their guide to uh, the state of Maryland, this yeah. WPA guide. Uh, they hired out of work journalists to write <laughs> tour guides to places like Kansas. It's just inconceivable mm. now. Um, but one of the things they did is they sent all these photographers uh, out into the field to document uh, how farmers lived, how poor people, how ordinary Americans lived. And it was a very populist program. And uh, the, the guy who ran it was actually the son of a actual populist from Kansas. And uh, he he said it was about introducing Americans to introducing America to Americans, and uh, all of these different uh, authors then would use the photography uh, that they had produced in this New Deal program. They would um, uh, 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 write books of text with the photographs as a as a kind of you know as a kind of running illustration. I imagine your um, your listeners are are familiar with this style of photography, but you mentioned Margaret. Burke White, here's another famous one, James uh, A. Walker Evans. This is probably the most famous of that genre. Let us now praise famous men uh, where they go and visit some uh, sharecroppers in the South and the author lives with them for a, a month or something like that. And they take, take these extremely intimate pictures of how these people live and what it's like um, you know, to live in this. Part. Anyhow, what a wonderful period. Um, I mean, a, a dreadful period economically, but a wonderful period uh, culturally. At least that's my opinion. So, so we had you know, Roosevelt and, you know, we, we talked very briefly about Martin Luther King. And it's just worth mentioning there about, again, not quite as high point as, as Roosevelt. I mean, Roosevelt King obviously wasn't in, in the same position as Roosevelt. But, but what was special about that period for, for the populist movement? Yes. So uh, Martin Luther King, if you... Um, you know, this is the great, of course, the great leader of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. And if you, his, in some ways, his greatest, tri his greatest triumph was the famous Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. It actually happened the very week that I was born. And uh, he, uh, at the very, at the climax of it, at the very end, this is also when the, the government, uh, the federal government passed the Voting Rights Act and restored the right to vote that had been taken away in the aftermath of the populist sort of revolt in the 1890s it had been taken away then and was restored in 1965. And uh, here is King on the steps of the Capitol building in Montgomery, Alabama, giving this fantastic speech. It's one of his truly great uh, uh, orations. Uh, and he's giving this at, at the, you know, the climax of his movement. And uh, in the middle of the speech, he actually he, he asks, you know, how did the Jim Crow system come about? You know, where did this come from? It hasn't been here always. It was invented by somebody. Why did they do it? And he goes back into the history and talks about the history of populism, uh, talks about the populist movement of the 1890s and how they tried uh, to bring together poor whites and poor blacks in a, you know, uh, uh, to rally around their common interests and sort of uh, vote out the uh, the uh, bourbon Democrats, the elite class in the South. And uh, what intrigues me about that, by the way, your viewers can you can find this speech very easily on YouTube. It's one of and I highly recommend that you watch it. <clears throat> it's one of his one of his truly great ones. Um, and he gets the history of populism. This is what intrigued me about it. He gets it exactly right which is not an easy feat anymore. If you know what I'm talking about, there's so much confusion around that word. And there already was by 1965. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. But here's Martin Luther King looking at it and he gets it exactly right. That's, that's very impressive. And then after he does that, he goes on this peroration about, uh, about Jim Crow and how the, the bourbon Democrats, you know, they took away everything from these 
uh, poor white farmers and gave them as a, uh, uh, as a replacement, gave them Jim Crow. And when the poor white farmer cried out for the food that his, you know, that he could no longer afford, he, he ate Jim Crow. He said he calls it a psychological bird that told him that no matter what, how awful his position was, he was better than black people. And so he, you know, it, 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 it he, he didn't, you know, sign up for movements like populism anymore. <clears throat> and it's, it's truly one of King's great speeches. What's also uh, the other thing that, that I, that I focus on with King and with his, um, his colleague Bayard Rustin, who was sort of the, the theorist and the uh, strategist of the civil rights movement in those days, um, is they we 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 have completely forgotten this about Martin Luther King that he was constantly trying and actually succeeding in uh, uh building alliances with the labor movement and he and it wasn't just like an alliances of convenience he saw the labor movement as engaged in <clears throat> excuse me engaged in a very similar project to what he was doing and he had a lot of allies in the labor movement that agreed with him uh, but today, uh, that's all that 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 part of history has been uh, utterly mm, deleted down the memory hole. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. I mean, uh, not Martin Luther King. We all know who he is. That's he's a, a you know, a, a much celebrated figure to this day. Uh, it's the uh, that organized labor was ever the great bulwark of um the left in America is completely forgotten, which it's the weirdest damn thing. But we'll talk about that. Yeah. So, so, or maybe we're out of time. What do I? No, no, no we've, got, we've got plenty of time. Don't worry. I wanted to come on to, um, you know, so we've got this great tradition of populism in the way you've described it. It's a very progressive force. We now see it as very different, where, you know, we, you know, you, and, and, what what has been this big shift? I mean, your book goes through, you know, the Nixon years, the Reagan years, the Carter years, and and so on. But but why have we almost flipped now to to um, populism being seen as you know nativist and racist and some sexist and and so on? Yeah, that is the great question. That's the question that I started with, and uh, you know you can trace it. <clears throat> you can trace it formally. Uh, when when historians decided to start using the word differently, and that happens in the 1950s. And for in, in my opinion, that's the most important sort of element of this story. When the American sort of intellectual class, the um, you know, professoriate, uh, basically turns on populism, meaning the historical movement in the 1890s, and takes the name of populism and redefines it as a, um, as a term for uh, the danger inherent in mass movements of working class people. And they decide that populism is xenophobic and racist and anti-Semitic and all the rest of this, um, not because the populist movement of the 1890s was, was but because they have, they have been persuaded by uh, psychological theory and mm, sociology of the time that all working class movements must be those things, that all working class movements harbor a kind of authoritarianism within them this is a very popular social theory in the 1950s, and they tried to apply it. There's a famous American historian called Richard Hofstadter who applied this to the populist movement in the 1890s and said, look, the populist movement was they were not, uh, you know, uh, progressive heroes. They were um, they were uh, uh, in the grip of all of these psychological pathologies. Uh, they represented people who were on their way down and people who are on their way down have these different complexes. It was all this sort of psycho history. Uh, and they, he's the one that said they were anti-Semitic and uh, they were uh, racist and et cetera, and xenophobic and fearful, hated cities, were fearful of, uh, were anti-intellectual, fearful of ideas. Now, you might have um, noticed something here, Andrew. This is uh, almost um, exactly the same um, bill of accusations that was thrown at the populists in 1896 by the uh, by the uh, sort of American elite of the time, uh, who who by today's standards would have been extremely right wing, and Richard Hofstadter sort of took that bill of accusation without ever acknowledging it. By the way, took that bill of accusation, um, recast it in trendy psychological language from the 1950s, 
and um, embraced it for liberalism. He, Hofstadter was a leading liberal of the 1950s. And so liberalism, uh, the leading liberals of the 1950s decided that uh, populism was the, the generic term for ex movements of the extreme right, uh, like uh, McCarthyism, like the John Birch Society, etc. cetera. Uh, now, long story short, Hofstadter turned out to be wrong about this. Uh, Hofstadter's history of, of populism was massively and overwhelmingly refuted in a very short amount of time. And there's entire books. I bet you're sick of me pulling books off the shelf, but this is the Bristol Ideas Festival, so I'm going to continue to do it. There's entire books written refuting Hofstadter. There is one about um, about Hofstadter and his friends, you know, but by Paul Rogan and nobody, you know, not widely read or anything. Hofstadter's um, book attacking populism came out in 1955. It won the Pulitzer Prize, a uh, massive bestseller. It's been it's been described as the most influential work of history ever written uh, by an American, that is. And uh, all the works refuting him, uh, you know, you, you kind of have to be an academic even to know that they exist. Uh, but he was overwhelmingly, I mean, every everything he said about populism, people write entire books about like single paragraphs in Hofstadter's account, uh, refuting it. There is almost no element of his attack on populism that, that anyone's historians still take seriously. However, his redefinition of populism, the you know, swiping the name of this movement and using it as a generic term for uh, the, these right wing pathologies that are supposedly uh, inherent in all working class movements that caught on. Now, ask yourself, why? Why would that catch on? This is a really interesting part of the story, because what Hofstadter and his friends and all these other intellectuals agreed with him and started using the word immediately, started using the word populism in this way, what they were doing was not just history and it wasn't just sociology. They were writing a manifesto for their generation of intellectuals. Okay, this is the 1950s. This is when the American university system is expanding by leaps and bounds. This is the heyday of managerialism. This is when uh, MBAs are starting to run the great American corporations. You know, it's not Vanderbilt's anymore. It's it's people out of Harvard uh, Business School. This is when people with PhDs are running the departments in Washington rather than political appointees. Uh, Robert McNamara is running the Pentagon. Remember the great prophet of managerialism who dreamed up the Vietnam War. You know, what a genius. And uh, these people are, 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 are rising up and they are the new elite or a new elite, I should say. There's always more than one elite. They, they were a new, you know, this rising uh, class of powerful people. And they wanted to describe what they were displacing. And their word for, you know, the old sort of uh, the left tradition that they were displacing, these are by and large, these are all liberals that I'm describing, uh, was the, the word that they came up with was populism, mass movements of working people in the street. And so Hofstadter's larger argument is that mass movements of working people don't get anything. They don't win. They don't achieve anything. The way you get things done, the way you manage an economy, the way you win the war against communism, the way you do all these things is by hiring people like Richard Hofstadter and his friends and putting them in charge. You know, this is they were called the consensus generation. And their great idea was that if you had a bunch of people like them sitting around a big table in Washington, D.C. That and agreeing with one another that they would solve your problems. You do not want mass movements of working class people in the streets like in the 30s or like in the 1890s. That leads to McCarthyism. It leads to fascism. It's dangerous. But if you have a lot of, uh, you know, highly educated, uh, white collar, you know, highly credentialed people, you know, that will solve your problems. And this idea, I would say this idea has conquered the world, this managerial philosophy. Again, the United States is slightly ahead of Europe in this. And by the 1970s, the American Democratic Party is in a kind of full-blown run to divorce itself from the labor movement and to recast itself as the party of these managerial elites of the sort of white collar professional class. You have people like Jimmy Carter, who are, is a step in that progression. Michael Dukakis, you know, who said they're, 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 it's not about ideology, it's about competence. Uh, Bill Clinton, 
you know, a Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law School, et cetera, et cetera, Barack Obama. And, uh, and you know, and that's that is who our party of the left is in America today. Uh, and that's uh, that's basically who the you know, that's happening all over the world now. But uh, again, we were slightly <laughs> I'm sorry to say we were slightly ahead of y'all on that one. Uh, any, I, t- I tend to talk too much, Mr. Andrew Kelly. Don't worry. I, I've got one more question which I wanted to ask you about. We'd, because I, we skipped, I, we, I haven't told you how we got Trump yet. No, well, this is what I wanted to come on to. So, so the position we're in now is we've got Donald Trump and you've got a Democratic Party, which is very different to what Franklin Roosevelt stood for. Yeah. Um, and well, it's uh, on formal things. It's you know, it's still this they, that like they they want to protect Social Security, which is Roosevelt's great. They yeah. want to, um, you know, they like the federal departments here in Washington, Department of Agriculture or whatever. They want to defend those things. So you know, they're 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 still in the tradition, but there's a, a really 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 important thing that has changed, which is that they are explicitly not a party of working people anymore. Uh, they they get the the votes of a lot of them. But that's not what they are about. When I was young, the Democratic Party was, uh, I mean, it, it, their identification with the what we call in America the middle class, which means sort of working class people who lead, you know, who, who, who lead a, 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 a middle class life. The Democratic Party's identification with the middle class was something that you could not miss. Everyone talked about it. Every Democrat reminded you of it all the time you go back and look at any speech of lyndon johnson's you know that's like he's he's talking about it again or hubert humphrey or any of these guys this is they talked about it constantly if you go back and watch rewatch the convention their convention that happened um a few weeks ago here they don't mention it at all uh it's not they're just that's not what they're about any longer uh and what that has permitted and I didn't even let you finish your question here. But here we go. Here we go. What that has permitted is this uh, 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 the Republican Party, which is the party of the right in America, to reach out to disgruntled uh, blue collar voters, uh, you almost exclusively white blue collar voters, and to bring them into the conservative coalition. And they have been doing this with uh, uh, Openly, it's not a secret. They've been doing it since 1968, since Richard Nixon first ran for the president. And uh, he did it with some success, more success in 1972. And it, it's been getting a little bit uh, worse every every four years. Uh, and the uh, uh, as they you know, they reach they, they, they basically the Republican Party today. And you can, again, confirm this by watching speeches at their convention that happened a few weeks ago, they talk about social class all the time in this really bitter, uh, uh, angry way that's very vague. It's almost never about economic issues, uh, except for in a very vague sense, like, you know, Trump got unemployment really low, you know, Uh, uh, but they 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 thrive on uh, class animosity in America. They talk about it all the time. Your hate for these white collar uh, managerial types that the, that that now sort of uh, are fully identified with the Democratic Party, and they do a excellent job at uh, speaking to this class anger. And by the way, never doing anything to um, to mitigate it. I mean, these these they, they get in power. You know, they used to call Trump the blue collar billionaire. Do you remember that? <laughs> Just it's it's nuts. He gets in power, and what does he do? This gigantic tax cut, the great Paul Ryan tax cut. It deregulates all of the, you know, you can pollute now, you know, more <laughs> without without fearing the EPA in America more than you could before he became president. You know, that's what a what an accomplishment, Mr. Trump, uh, you know. But if you go back and look at the convention, it's just class war all the time. And so we have this and I know I should shut up now, but we have this. This is where the book ends. You've got this situation in America where we simply do not have a traditional party of the left. And it's arguably you don't have one in England either. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Arguably you don't have one in the United Kingdom either, you know, or or, or a lot of these European countries. And it's, and it's like what we've been doing in America since the 1970s is running this gigantic experiment to see what happens to a middle-class society when you no longer have a party of Franklin Roosevelt. You no longer have organized labor. You no longer have real populism. 
And and what you know, you have the inset, you have this insane extremes of inequality. All that stuff from the 1890s is back. Monopolies are back. We don't enforce antitrust laws anymore. Uh, there's all of these efforts to disenfranchise people. Um, it's uh, you know, the and the rich are in a different world than you and me. Uh, and at the same time, you have uh, these incredible right wing demagogues. Uh, you know, rising up who will, uh, who, who, you know, who, who are able to prevail by playing on this class animosity, this feeling, these feelings of frustration, but without ever doing anything about it. <laughs> and uh, that's what, it, that's, that's the world that we're in now. And that's where the book ends. I'm sorry to say. Well, I just want to bring in some, some, some of the audience questions, which, which link to, to what you've been talking about there. The first is about the, 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 the relation, sorry, the, the contrast between, populism as it's seen now in the United States and, and what we see in Europe. So, for example, you know, you could call Orban's government a populist government. You could call, you know, I mean, Boris people, do, people do call them that. I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. But say, but anyway, what, what have you got particular views on? I mean, that's an important view in itself in terms of of, of, of looking at that. But say Boris Johnson and, and the government he's running here, would you see that as a populist government? No, in certainly not. It's, uh, you know, but it's, um, Look, they do. Uh, so I look, I'm not the language police. I'm not here to stop you from saying things. I, I don't think I can reverse. You know, when when I started writing this book, my wife said, you know, you're going to get everybody in the world to stop using this word in this way. No, I'm not. I'm not. I don't have that kind of power. Um, I want to point out where the word comes from, though, and that it's, it's an honorable tradition in our country, because I think that abusing the word in this way goes hand in hand with turning your backs with turning our backs on this real tradition because the word is not it's not just a word it smuggles in a whole um a way of looking at the world richard hofstadter's way of looking at the world which is that working class movements are inherently authoritarian and scary and dangerous which is false uh, and uh uh but when we use the word in that way I, I I mean, there are people, of course, who use it that way and they're they're particular. They're totally innocent and they, they mean it uh, uh, in, in, with, you know, it's completely OK. I'm you know, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but when almost whenever I see that word used by an American intellectual, they mean the other side of the coin as well. They they're also implying that working class movements are these things that 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 we are in that. Well, the deplorables that yeah. people who that that, you know, the vast unwashed of America really should just shut up and, and stay out of politics and stay out of trying to run things. This it, completely contemptuous attitude towards democracy itself that goes hand in hand with uh, the abuse of the word populism, uh, not all the time, but often enough so that it, it needs to be called out. And, and this is really, and this is, I suppose what I was getting at is, is and it, it refers to another question we've asked is about the aim of, of the work, which is, are you trying to recover that, well, is it possible to return the word to its original origins or do we need almost like a new word? Uh, we do need a new word. Yes. So I uh, look, uh, it, it is it, it is important to remember that there is. So I've written about sort of what I call fake populism for a long time. I wrote a book years ago called What's the Matter with Kansas about this uh, about this phenomenon, about uh what I just described, right wing politicians mm -hmm. using appealing to uh, stoking class anger uh in but but uh, but i call it false populism because they are appealing to this sort of uh, you know uh, pretending to be part of this populist tradition but in fact in reality the populists the real deal were, were zeroed in on economic issues that's all they talked about you know uh with a, a few exceptions having to do with political reform now they wanted to like nationalize the railroads get farm programs from the federal government get us off the gold standard it's you know et cetera et cetera et cetera they zeroed in on they never talked about culture war issues they avoided them and today it's nothing but that it's only culture war issues so i call it fake populism but you are absolutely right that we need a new word for it um you know this uh this sort of because the phenomenon is real these right wing politicians using the language of social class uh, uh you know look at trump he does it all the time i was just rewatching last night um uh, his uh, speech to the Republican convention. And it's, it is, it is ferocious piece of class war. If they, if it wasn't for the uh, disastrous pandemic that we're in, this guy would get reelected. 
you know, it's that people are really angry about what is happening to their lives. And he speaks to that. Not in a way he's never going to provide a solution. Um, you know, absolutely not. But he does. Uh, 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 he's has a way of capturing their anger. He's a giant political middle finger extended at the elite of this country. <laughs> and, and there's a, there's a couple of questions which I'd, I'd like to ask. The first is about, and I suppose it links to what's going to happen in November in the United States. Is you know what are the dangers of this approach on the future of democracy? <sighs> Look, the danger is that this is not going to end with Trump. Uh, I think Trump will probably lose this November just because you can't just on the fundamentals, uh, you can't bungle a national crisis as badly as he has done and get reelected. And we just have learned today, you know, from the Bob Woodward revelation, how, you know, how how bad the bungling has been. This guy has it's just it's just. His handling this has been inconceivably bad. Now, I don't want to entirely blame it on Trump because I also think it's because we don't have a national health system in the United States. Uh, the, it, it, the, the populists uh, or people in the populist tradition, I should say, tried to get that, but they were stopped. Harry Truman, for example, campaigned on it in 1948 and won, but he was eventually he was stopped. So we never got that in this country. Uh, and we still to this day, you know, you go to the hospital, you are um you are basically playing with your, uh, you know, your bank account. You, 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 you could come out of there bankrupt. You have no idea. They throw a surprise billing at you. You know, you walk into a room and they, and they're like, Ooh, that'll cost you a hundred thousand dollars. And you get the bill one day in the mail and insur- your insurance company's like, sorry, we don't cover that. You know, it's just, it's just something made up, but you can't get out of it. This happens in America all the time. People don't want to go to, ho- I'm getting off track here. We don't have a national health care system in this country. Health care is a privilege in this country. You have it if you have a good job. Um, and everybody's losing their jobs in this pandemic. I mean, it's a, it's just a, a catastrophe upon a catastrophe upon a, you know, and uh, uh, it's, it's not all Trump's fault, but oh my God, has he mishandled this. And the uh, the you know the the economic disaster that that it's, that has accompanied it. I mean, I was at dinner last night with some people, and they're just talking about they're they're laying off everyone because they're figuring out all sorts of ways to do everything more efficiently over the internet now. Zoom conversations, you know, this is happening everywhere. Those jobs aren't a lot of them are not going to be coming back. Mm-hmm. It uh, it stinks, and he should pay. Mm-hmm. Now that said, that said, and Joe Biden friendly guy. Uh, he doesn't have, you know, he has a, in my opinion, a lousy record as a, as a U.S. Senator, but uh, everybody loves that guy. It's hard to hate Joe Biden. Uh, it, he seems like a winner. Okay. That said, there's going to be another Trump four years from now. And the next Trump isn't going to be as stupid as this one. This guy is one of the worst politicians, Trump, I mean, one of the worst politicians I've ever laid eyes upon. The idea of going down the list of American ethnic groups and insulting them. Politicians, real politicians do the opposite. You know, they march in parades, they celebrate. You know, and and he's, he's just a complete jerk. And uh, the next Trump will be using his same, uh, the, 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 fa- the phony class war stuff, um, you know, the economic nationalism stuff. Uh, we'll be using that, but won't be making the kind of amateur mistakes that Trump made. What's worse, they will actually govern effectively. Trump has like a- had no idea how to be president. He's got a slightly better idea now, but when he came into that, he didn't know what he was doing in the least, and he and he he couldn't figure out to hire good advisors. You know, it's like all I'm saying is this: the next Trump, we got lucky with this guy because he he stumbled onto the formula to beat the Democratic Party, to really thrash them soundly, you know, as he did with Hillary Clinton. And we can talk about that in a second. But he was too dumb to figure, you know, to figure out how to play it into um, the next Trump won't be that dumb. That's all I'm saying. We if if the Democrats don't figure this out, I mean, quickly, we're going to have a future of these guys. And that's what the future looks like. Just more and more and more of this, of the hate and the anger and, you know, the polit- politics reduced to a TV show uh, and uh, inequality worse and worse and worse. Healthcare worse and worse and worse. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the future. Why do why am I absolutely certain that's the future? Because this has been going on since Nixon. Nixon started it. Nixon was fairly good at it. Reagan was much better. Newt Gingrich was better than that. George W. Bush, not so great at it, but they're all building on the same tradition. Trump is the sort of maximum statement of it, but there'll be another one four years from now. I'm afraid we're out of time, Thomas. Um, we've got, I knew that would happen. We, we unfortunately haven't had a chance to ask a number of the questions, but we'll 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 put them online, and hopefully we'll we can continue the. the yes, the- and and people can write me emails uh, through my website, and I hope they look. Most of these questions are going to be answered in the book, and I hope people grab it. They're gonna they're gonna enjoy it, and I just want to point out that uh, the a lot of the political cartoons that are there uh, that I talked about are available on my website tcfrank.com, and they're um. They're very amusing. They're very awful. Uh, the 1890s crazy time. Check it out. We, we put the website in the in the chat as well, and we'll we'll um, refer to that, and we'll link to on our social media feeds plus some of the other questions we've had. I want to thank you very much for 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 participating. If you want to get Thomas's book, as I said, it, it's published by Scribe Publications over here, and it's available from our partners at Waterstones and in Waterstone shops around the country. Uh, a word of apology from me. I my notes suddenly disappeared at the start. And I forgot to mention who I am. My name's Andrew Kelly. And I'm direct- <laughs> I, I said it. I said who you I were. Very kindly <laughs> said that then. Um, the debate will continue. This is part of a series we're running on the future of democracy. And there are more events on our website that we've recorded already. And next week, link to this, we are um, we're looking at meritocracy with Michael Sandell. Oh, um, that's a, isn't that a great? That is a great subject. That was in my last book. Yeah. Listen, and, liberal. liberal. And that's something else which we'll be uh, promoting as well. Um, as I said, it's published by Scribe Publications, Scribe Books, and we're very grateful to them, to Adam Howard and Sarah Braybrook for participating with, with us. Uh, and thank you so much, Thomas Frank, for joining us. Uh, this is Festival Ideas Online. Have a good evening, and we hope to have you join us again. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I wish I was there. That's all I can say. You'd be very welcome to come to Christmas <laughs> anytime, Thomas. Thank you very much. All right.